from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, good morning, every well, I guess good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Winkler. I am a historian with the Naval Historical Foundation here in Washington at the Washington Navy Yard. And uh, I'm a volunteer with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. And I'm glad you're all here today. This is going to be a very interesting session because uh, we're going to have a conversation with some real Americans talking about how they contributed to the war effort uh, in the uh, Pacific with the Marine Corps. Uh, we have uh, Keith Little and Samuel Smith, and uh, we have Sam Billison. I understand he's on the 14th Street Bridge tied up behind a bunch of uh, Rolling Thunder motorcycles on his way in. So hopefully uh, he'll, he'll uh, be joining us later in the conversation. Uh, what uh, we're here to talk about is the Navajo Code Talkers, which is one of the interesting stories of the Second World War. Uh, basically, after Pearl Harbor, there was this fellow, fellow by the name of Philip Johnston. He was a son of a missionary who had uh, uh, grown up in, uh, on the uh, Navajo reservation and had spent about 24 years there. Well, in February 1942, uh, Johnston approached Major General Fogel, who was the uh, commanding general of the Amphibious Forces Pacific, and he says, you know, I have an idea. I have an idea that can help us win the war. What we have, if, because he was familiar with the Navajo language, he thought that would be a very good means of communication, secure communications between Marine forces to expedite uh, you know, the tactical situations on, uh, in combat and, and to save lives. So he pitched this idea, and the, uh, the general probably was like, I don't know if he was from Missouri, but he said, show me. So what he did is he got these... Uh, there were these uh, four Navajos who lived in the Los Angeles area, and on February 28th, uh, 1942, they did this. They staged this demonstration, and I'm 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 guessing the demonstration probably was something like this, where would hand a uh, one of the uh, Navajos a message, something like this. And uh, could you translate that and to uh, Sam Smith? Yeah, go ahead. My name is uh, Keith Little. I'm a Navajo code talker, and uh, I live in Crystal, New Mexico. And, but originally, I was raised in the uh, western part of the Navajo Nation in Arizona. I have a family in Crystal, New Mexico, so that, that keeps me grounded there. Also, that um, <clears throat> Uh, I served in the Marine Corps uh, from 19, May 1943 to uh, November 27, 1945. And today I'm going to mention we talk about the Navajo Code Talkers a lot. A lot of people ask who are the Navajo Code Talkers? What did they do? and where did they come from. So uh, the origination of the Navajo Code Talkers and why they were originated is something I'm going to talk about today. And uh, in, uh, immediately after December the 7th, 1941, uh, the Japanese were very successful in uh, capturing and occupying a lot of land in Southeast Asia and uh, some into China. Of course, we know they invaded the uh, Philippines and they landed on Wake Island and Guam. So uh, by, uh, by the first month of the war, and they were everywhere in uh, in the Southeast Asia and the South Pacific. And by, num by uh, April 1942, they um, occupied a lot of Southeast Asia. A lot of our garrison and Philippines were captured and became prison war. And uh, quite a few Navajo boys were in that garrison in the uh, Philippines. They were the first one to be drafted into the, uh, I guess they were 
a lot of them were members of New Mexico National Guard. So they wound up in the Philippines with uh, 200 Coast Artillery. And uh, those, some of those were my friends, their older friends, but I associated with them a lot. And uh, when I first saw them in uh, uh, Army uniform, uh, they, they look pretty, pretty sharp. And they look good, so I, I wanted to enlist in, uh, in the Army also. But uh, I was uh, re really young at that time. In 1941, I was only 15 years old. And uh, in 1942, I was uh, 16 years old. But I was not aware of uh, United States Marine Corps prior to uh, 1942, the middle, of, the middle of 1942. And the story goes back to, to about the Navajo Code Talkers. How did they get into the war? And uh, it starts with a fellow named Philip Johnston. That he lived in Los Angeles, a civil engineer. And uh, he was also his parents. He lived on the Navajo reservation. He had a missionary parent, so he uh, he was raised with the Navajo playmates. And he knew how to talk Navajo. Like we say, uh, white man's Navajo, heavy accent. <laughs> so um, anyway, he knew about the Navajos, how complex their language is. It's hard to learn for a non-Navajo to learn. So uh, he and uh, a bunch of Navajos were working in Los Angeles in uh, defense jobs. He gathered a few of them up and run down to San Diego and uh, come before a, uh, a communication commander and showed them uh, how the Navajo language could be used as a code. And the reason for that, one of the reasons is that um, some of the uh, American Indian the Army had been used in World War I, and he knew about it. Being uh, associated with the Navajos, of course, that became very interested with him. So he recommended that uh, that way he demonstrated uh, how it's going to work, how it should work, and convinced the Marine Corps commanders to uh, at least try out. So the Marine Corps uh, from San Diego sent uh, sent uh, the Marine recruiters to Navajo land. And there they set up their, uh, their recruiting station somewhere around Window Rock and Fort Defiance and visit the schools around Fort Wingate, Ship Rock, and some of the schools uh, on the reservation. But I don't know why they did not come to the school that I was attending. I would have been very interesting, but that's one of the reasons that I uh, had not heard of the United States Marine Corps up to that time. Now, this was in March 1940. It was happening. So when they were uh, signing up uh, Navajo men for a potential communication specialists, they call them, they call them uh, communication specialists. The term Navajo code talker had not been uh, determined yet. So uh, they went and uh, they said, it is said that they recruited or that over 600 men signed up. Well, I don't know how many days they were on the reservation, but according to the stories that I, that I, that I read, it, uh, that they had over 600 uh, people up. Some of them even come uh, to, to the recruiting station carrying their 22 rifles. So um, that is uh, the beginning. And uh, so the, re the requests, the, the, the Marine Corps themselves, they wanted uh, 200. And that's the way the request was made to the Commandant. 
And they, uh, when, when they received the authorization back, they told them they only get 30 for a trial project. So meanwhile, the 30, the, the, some of the potential uh, communication specialists were already selected. So the 30 was picked out. On departure day, only 29 showed up. One didn't show up. So they uh, sent them to San Diego Crew Depot. They went through uh, boot camp with flying colors because they were physically fit. And they were an unusual uh, platoon, the first platoon to ever uh, Native American, uh, uh, in particular Navajos. They were uh, made up one, one platoon, I think it's uh, 382nd platoon during that time. When they finished their their uh, boot camp, they were shipped on up to um, Camp Elliott. There, they, uh, they were given a workroom, a classroom. They said that the building had steel barred windows. I don't know if that's true or not, but that is the way the story goes. And, and uh, there they, uh, they were given uh, a pamphlet of uh, military words like, like this guy has. All the words that are used in battlefield, in other words, battlefield language, and names of all the weapons that are used, and uh, the names of the units, and uh, even the names of the countries around the world. Now, they were, to, they were told to give it um, a Navajo word to each one of these words, but they went a little further. So, and devised a code so that it is a Navajo code, not a regular Navajo language. Just a code like uh, they, they give terms uh, to, uh, to the weapons that are used, like a machine gun, uh, something like that, you know, fast shooter fast shooting gun, and then uh, such, such terms as uh, airplanes, a fighter plane is a hummingbird, Tahiti, Tahiti. And then grenades as uh, potatoes, eggs as bombs, all the Navajo. So when, uh, when, when you're sending a message and set for supplies, if the Grand Lady is in, in, included, they will be potatoes. So uh, that, 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 that devised these in such a way that it will be confusing to anyone that would try to break it. So that's the way that the, the first, also the alphabet. The, uh, the ordinary alphabet has 26 letters, but they come up with uh, 46, I think it is. And some of the most commonly used were assigned three code words. Like the, the letter A, it has uh, th three words that, uh, that uh, indicates uh, Able, the letter A, such as apple, in Navajo term for apple, ants, and X, Belasana, Wallachi, and uh, Senes. These were uh, Navajo, Navajo coded words for the letter A, so you when you're spelling a letter, you don't you, you don't repeat 
A the second time, you use another letter. So that is the way it is. Or in uh, spelling out a word in Navajo, if there is, uh, if there is uh, two letters, like an E following each other. Now the letter E was, uh, had three also. Uh, ear, eye, and L. So when you're spelling a word out, you say uh, when, uh, when two, two letters follow each other, you say uh, uh, like that. Two, le uh, two uh, an ear following each other. This, this is the way it would turn out if you write it down the way it's said. But it is that for a letter, for a letter E, like hip, you'll say tlza ajalke as besot de is pig. So that 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 that's the way uh, that that's the way the the word was created. So it's rather very much confusing if you write the letter down. But anyway, um, that is how the first 29 Marines that were recruited on the Navajo res Reservation created the code. Very uh, uh, devised in such a way that it is scheme to fool somebody, the enemy. And the reason it was done is that um, the Japanese had also broken our American code. And uh, we were, the, the United States, I guess, were trying to come up with some, uh, some form of communication where they can send messages freely without interference. And Navajo code became that, replaced that original, the codes, the natural codes that were used by the military. So while they were, uh, when, when it was all done, uh, that's how the Navajo code was created, Navajo code talkers. So the first group were sent to uh, South Pacific. And, and can I uh, pick it up from here? Because mm -hmm. uh, that was, that, that's an excellent uh, overview of how the code came about. And there were some things that I learned here that first of all, there, there were Navajos who were captured by the Japanese in the Philippines. So the Japanese had access to the Navajo language, which is an unwritten language. So what these 29 folks had to do is they had to create a code within the language uh, so that it couldn't even be deciphered by Nav Navajos. So uh, that, that was a, you know, a very clever accomplishment. And then, uh, as you mentioned, your uh, folks were put out in the, uh, into the field of battle. Now, what I'd like to do is give uh, Sam Smith and Sam Billison an opportunity. Uh, first of all, I got to ask the question, uh, and you uh, 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 asked, answered it really, why to join the Marine Corps? Uh, could you talk a little bit about what motivated you to join the Marines? And then could you talk a little bit about that training you had up at Camp Elliott and going into the field? So. You, Yate. Everybody say Yate. You just broke the coat. <laughs> uh, the way I uh, uh, enlisted in the Marine Corps was that um, in 1943 I was in high school and they, uh, they had captions in the Albuquerque Journal and the radio. KOB, they always have a short uh, sentence there, the few, the brave, the Marines. And I always wanted to be one of those when I was in high school. And then to make it worse, John Wayne was making some Marine pictures. It really made me want to go there. So I enlisted while I was in, uh, it was in April in the senior year. In, uh, the recruiter told me to uh, wait, finish your high school, get your diploma, and then we'll come and get you. 
Sure enough, on uh, graduation day, I looked over there, there were two Marines sitting over there <laughs> in their Marine uh, blues. So I knew they were waiting for me. There were three of us. Uh, Samuel Smith was one of them, and then the other guy was uh, Virgil Kirk. Uh, he didn't. He didn't join the uh, the coat tuggers. He went with the uh, Air Force, I think. And uh, anyway, uh, they took us to the uh, Santa Fe. We passed the uh, physical, and. Uh, they shipped me to uh, San Diego right away. I don't know what they did with these other two. And uh, I got in the boot camp, went through there like all the Marines. And uh, I really enjoyed the boot camp because I was physically in shape, because I had played football, basketball, baseball, and track. And a lot of a lot of guys were falling down because in May, latter part in May, it was very hot in San Diego. Martian was poked back and uh, running and uh, some guys were just falling over. But uh, I, I really enjoyed all that obstacle courses and uh, a lot of boys thought I was crazy. But uh, it, it was, I really enjoyed the, uh, the boot camp and uh, after that, the, there was an officer. He, he asked me, hey, uh, chief, are you an Indian? I said, no, sir, I'm a Navajo. <laughs> so he said, uh, he said, uh, oh, good, he said, do you, know, do you speak Navajo? Yes, sir. Do you understand Navajo? Yes, sir. And, uh, and uh, there was, uh, this other guy was with me in the platoon, uh, also a Navajo. He was standing right beside me. The officer said, how about you, chief? He says, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so the officer said, get your sea bag, throw it in the Jeep, I'll take it to Oceanside. I thought, gee, what's he going to do with us at Oceanside? I didn't know there was the name of a town. So in the ocean side, there's a big brand new camp, marine camp, great big barracks, and uh, we drove in front of one of the barracks, and there's all these young Navajos studying. I guess they were studying code. And, uh, and I thought, gee, I thought, I just came from the reservation. I don't want to be with these Navajos. I want to be with the Marines. <laughs> so. We stopped there and we, we registered and we started studying that uh, the coat. The coat was very difficult because uh, it was coded. It was not for language, but it was coded. So, uh, but after you learn it, it was easy. A lot of Navajos didn't pass that coat. A lot of them had to take it over two or three times to qualify. And uh, out of all those Navajos that come in every year, every summer, only uh, 421 qualified to be uh, coat talkers. And that's how many we had during the war. And uh, so uh, it was easy after you learned it because it just came in uh, three areas, three phase. Anything that flew were named after different types of birds. Anything on the ground were named after those things that are on the ground, like weapons and machines and personnel and all this. And anything that float or submerged were named after fish. So, so it was just in three areas. When, when the coat is coming over, if they say city, which is bird, you know it's some kind of an airplane. And if they said something on the uh, on the ground, like he mentioned uh, a Yanzi, I think a Yanzi was bomb. And uh, if if he says fish or show that some kind of a ship, so you you notice right away what area that that coat belongs. So, uh, but during the process of teaching while we're learning, it was top secret. You couldn't take notes. There was nothing in writing. Everything was verbal. You just put it in your head and try to keep it there. 
and then uh, and uh, you can't go outside and talk about it. Everything stays in here. You can't go to Los Angeles, have a couple of beers, and tell your girlfriend, hey, uh, there's a coat, you know, it goes like this. You can't do that. So, And then during the war, it was top secret. Only four people knew about that coat. The, uh, the officer that want to send the message and the officer that receives the message. And the coat talk sends the message and the coat that receives the message. When they, they send the coat, only those two uh, Navajo code talks know about it. Once they, once they send it, they don't talk about it. it. It's put away somewhere, and you don't gossip about it. And uh, and and uh, I guess you would give give it if you talk about it. So once you send it, that's the end of it. So uh, and then uh, the. Uh, the NAFTA requirements to join the Marines were, one was uh, they asked you, do you know how to swim? One of the men that you know how to swim. And the Navajo boys said, oh yeah, you know, I know how to swim. When they get, you know, there's no water on the reservation. <laughs> and uh, and uh, during the boot camp, there's a, a day that they call qualification. You qualify for rifle, qualify for optical uh, courses, qualify for swimming, qualify to jump about 35, 40 feet off the tire into the water with full pack and stay alive. And, uh, and one day, the swimming came up. They lined us up. They were. Uh, this other boy and myself, this Navajo boy, his name was Robert Malone. So we lined up, blew the whistle, then a dog paddle all the way across. <laughs> Halfway back, I, I, I went down. San Diego has a, a real big uh, Olympic-sized pool where you have to qualify. You have to go across, come back, across, come back. I think it's four times. And uh, I went down and I got to the bottom, pushed myself up and looked at the lifesaver and he was looking the other way. I went down again, pushed myself up again. He's still looking the other way. <laughs> the third time, same thing, still looking the other way. And I thought, gee, fourth time, I barely came back up. He looked at me and he says, what's the matter, chief? I said, help. <laughs> By that time, my arms were limb, my legs were limb. I, I couldn't float. I was just standing straight up like this. And he jumped after me and uh, pulled me out. And the next day, we had a big list. My name was on there. Casualty company, nonsense. <laughs> I thought, gee, they wouldn't get me out of the Marines. And uh, so for two weeks, they, they uh, taught us how to swim, taught us to turn strokes, and, uh, and uh, we qualified eventually. And then, uh, then I didn't have to worry about it. But to make it worse, uh, just about, uh, I, was with, I was with the 5th Marine Division. They did away with what they called our Carson Raiders. Carson Raiders were the top unique uh, group in the, in the South Pacific. And uh, when they did away with that, they established what they called Reconnaissance Company. So they, they uh, asked for volunteers. And about five or six of Navajo Cook Talkers, we volunteered, not knowing what it was. We know what it was, they were $50 more in paycheck. <laughs> and uh, come to find out, you're supposed to know how to swim underwater. And here we go again, you didn't know how to swim underwater. So we had to, they had to take out, this time they had to take us out of the ocean. They cut us a little ways in rubber boats, they dump us and they say, swim underwater back to shore. Oh, I thought, I thought they'd get me out of the Marines yet, you know. But we we qualified, and that that swimming was really 
problem with us. So, uh, but this Navajo code, it got, uh, they used it on Iwo, uh, Guadalcanal. That's the first time the Marines landed, going back towards Tokyo. Uh, Guadalcanal is uh, situated in the Salmon Islands, just a few miles from Australia. That's how far the Japanese have gone. They have taken all of Eastern Asia, Borneo, Philippines, and most of the Salmon Islands. So, so that the Marine, the first and second Marine Division landed on the Guadalcanal, and then some islands and in, in, uh, in, uh, Salmon. They took all those, and but on Guadalcanal they had a little problem. Uh, they didn't. Uh, the, the Marines didn't know about the code, so they heard this over the radio, and they start complaining to the officers. Hey, the Japanese were taking over our communication, and here was Navajo code. So the more complaints coming in, the finally the general said, "Well, let's let's test these Indians. They're going to give me give us a problem." So they wrote a small message, combat message, and the United States uh, Marines uh, sent the message. When they send a message, when they receive it, it's still in code. So go to an officer to decipher it, go to an officer to see if it's today's code, to see if it's the correct uh, code, then another one to see if it's coming from the right place to the right place. Almost two hours before it got to the general. So he said, let's try the Indians. When the Navajo sent the code, it's being deciphered as it's coming over the air. When the receiver gets it, it's in English. So he hands it to the general, two and a half minutes. So so uh, general said, geez, I, I don't believe this. Write another one, let's try another one. Same thing happened, the American message, almost two hours, the Navajo quote, two and a half minutes. Well, general says, let's keep those damn Indians. And uh, some of these Navajos are short, you know, and dark complexed, dark, uh, black hair. Some of them have slant eyes a little bit. They were mistaken for Japanese, and they were thrown in the brick. And the uh, Navajos had to go over there and talk to them and bail them out. Hey, he's a Navajo. Get him, get him out. We need him. So, but uh, this code got so significant, so fast so correct that by Iwo Jima, the main communication was Navajo code. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And that's a good place, because uh, I want to turn it over to uh, uh, Sam Smith, because I have a question for him. Okay. And wh what we're going to do is talk about Iwo Jima with the three is uh, in the next question. One more oh. point. Oh, you, one one more. More. Okay, go ahead. Don't cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> now I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, the, uh, they caught a Navajo on the Philippines, but he, uh, fortunately, he was in the army. They took him to Tokyo. They uh, took all his clothes off, put him out in the parade ground. His feet were frozen to the pavement. They kept drilling him. They said, what does this message say? And he tell them, this is what it says. It's Navajo language, and this is what it says. And it didn't make any sense. So uh, they keep after him. They finally they gave up, gave up on him. So uh, they put him back in prison. Pretty soon the war was over. He came back, came back to Tuba City. And uh, we, when we saw him over there, he said, uh, I don't like Navajo coat talkers. You put me in trouble. <laughs> so, uh, but there's a lot, lot of, uh, uh, we found out that the Navajo language was the most powerful 
the most sacred, the most beautiful language. And I'm sure that all the Native American languages are like that also. So we found out this, this was like that. And the Navajo Code Talkers, we, we uh, um, accept, acknowledge, and, and respect all the military branches of the United States uh, Armed Forces. Uh, God bless you. God bless America. What, what I wanted to ask, uh, one of the ironies here is that uh, before the war there was an effort, I guess, to eliminate the Navajo language or you're not supposed to talk uh, Navajo in school and such. And here the Navajo language basically saves hundreds of lives during World War II. Uh, what I wanted to do is ask uh, uh, Samuel Smith uh, a little bit about that and then talk about uh, how the, uh, the code talkers were accepted amongst the Marines uh, in the field. And then uh, I'd like you to talk about Iwo Jima and then we'll have the, the other two gents talk about their experiences at Iwo Jima uh, because that, and talk about how the code worked actually in combat situations. So could you uh, take it there? Thank you. Hello, fellow citizens. Before, uh, before I went to war, I lied about my age too to get in Marine Corps because uh, I didn't like the way Pearl Harbor was attacked, sneak attack Sunday morning. And I'm in Arizona, and the uh, USS Arizona was sunk over there, still, still underwater. Those two and some other things that made me uh, angry, so I decided to get in and get even. And uh, I was only 15 when that happened. Uh, so I work on it. I, uh, before that, uh, my grandparents and my parents got me in a condition to be a Marine. When I was born, they gave me a warrior's name. So I had to be a warrior. And I didn't know that would come about shortly, but that's what happened. Uh, I lied about my age, like he said. We went down to, uh, to uh, Albuquerque recruiting office, and uh, I, had, I was in 11th grade. And him and uh, the judge were accepted. And I went back outside, uh, thought about it, felt bad about it. So I went back inside and I told the recruiter that I had made a mistake in my uh, birth year. So I lowered it and he said, by golly, you're right. <laughs> <coughs> And uh, so on my discharge paper, it says uh, uh, inducted, discharged, enlisted before I was sworn in. And that's the way it's written on my uh, discharge paper. And I have to deal with two different birth years of my life today. I have a driver's license that is older then I have some other records that I have to deal with that are younger. So that's the way it is. I never got it straightened up. But uh, I did uh, the serve boot camp down San Diego, 13 weeks crash course how to kill. And when I was going down there, I told my mother I got drafted. And she, she said, well, we can't do nothing about it, son, go. So uh, my grandpa came one night to do some blessing on me to, 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 to go serve in, in combat. I knew there was killing. I knew I was going to get killed or something. But uh, it didn't matter. I, my, what I'm going to do was important. 
And <clears throat> he to went and touched my uh, arm. He said, grandson, you're still a punk, he said. And uh, you haven't caught a coyote pup yet. And I said, that's all right, Grandpa. I'll get some on the way. <clears throat> and uh, I didn't know what he meant. But you know, catching a coyote pup is in your term talking to your son about birds and bees. That's what it was. <laughs> and I, I was going to catch some on the way. <laughs> and <clears throat> so I went. I finished 13 weeks. Uh, earned some of the things that I'm wearing now. And at the end of the uh, graduation, they gave us an aptitude test to be what we want to be in Marine Corps. I wanted to fly because I wanted to get even with those uh, snake attackers. So I chose air wing. I wanted to be a pilot. I passed the aptitude test, but they came back and told me I don't have a diploma. And they're right, I had just finished 11th grade. So ne my next choice was uh, artillery because that one will do a lot of damage. And I wanted to do that. By that time, they found out I was a Navajo. I was different in color. So they came back and said, are you a Navajo? I said, yes, sir. That's when they uh, told me to go with them with my sea bag up to Oceanside, Camp Pendleton. And I didn't, never knew about the Navajo Coat Talker School, but I found out that's where it was to train to the communication. And uh, we, I only, we only did not learn just the Navajo Coat. We also took other training in case we, we had to learn the Morse code, blinker, uh, panels, semaphore, and our own code. That's what we had to learn and memorize. So that happened in about four months or three months. They, uh, they told us that uh, they wanted to give us a test so we can get promoted to sergeant. And I did my best and made good grade. That only got me in the 4th Marine Division. No promotion. I was still PFC when I left. So I was placed with the uh, general. I think his name was Smith uh, or Schmidt that was in charge of 4th Marine Division at that time. Later, uh, Clifton B. Cates took over. And, uh, <clears throat> and I thought I had it made being next to the general, back behind the lines. Nope, I was wrong. When I was with the general in the combat, every once in a while, a group would come by and they would want some volunteers and I'm always at the end of their finger. <laughs> and uh, that's how I had some of the terrible experiences in the combat. The first uh, combat we had was Marshall Islands, Quadrilene. Roy No More spent about a week there and came back to Maui, second uh, biggest island in uh, Honolulu group. That's where they, we uh, practiced with uh, kill in action, wounded in action, and all the Navajo coat talkers were brought up from regiments and battalions to the division headquarters where we had it, where we could study our uh, uh, our Navajo coat, and if we had any problem in the in combat. That was where we made the correction or make it so that it can be faster. And so on like that, after 
we finished with that one. When we're ready to go into combat, all these Navajo coat talkers were put back down to their respective uh, positions down the regiment, battalion, and companies all the way up to uh, front echelon. They, they were kind of put around like I was to wherever they would be needed, wherever the uh, Navajo coat would be needed. That's how the, the Marine Corps operate the Navajo coat talkers. So we hit the Saipan. I don't remember the dates, but we, we were there about uh, three weeks, I think. We lost one uh, coat talker, and we rest there about a week, regroup, and go down south to Tinian, which when we took care of it right away, because the uh, Japanese were doing a benzai attack and all we did was pick them up. And after that, we went back to Maui and practiced with the uh, replacements. Replacements were always waiting, or they're always over there waiting for us. And we get down to business right away to do the maneuvers, skirmishes, and again, all the Navajo coat talkers come up to the division headquarters to, to train, practice again on the coats. And uh, usually we, we have problems, so we correct those and so we can use it. At that time, myself and my assistant were flown over to Pearl Harbor. And there I found uh, other instructors from other Marine Corps division that were brought from uh, other islands. And they had the same problem we had. So we put all the books together, made it one book, and took it back to our division to uh, learn that one and get ready. Um, here it was, Iwo Jima. That's where uh, uh, the night before attack, uh, at the briefing, they said we would take the island in one week. And it took us one week to get off the beach. So that, that's how the, the, we worked. And on that island, uh, we, we found out that there was too many leaves under the land. I don't know how many on top of each other. Uh, the flamethrower tank went in and burned them out and covered those caves. But one or two days later, they would dig themselves out and we would be a attacked from behind. That's how it took so long to to get that island secured. It, we, we were there about 30 some days. And before we finish getting the whole island, a flying fortress coming back from Japan landed there. There was two, two airfields. One of those big ones landed there. That, that was the purpose of getting that island so that there was the, the Burman planes coming back, run short of gas, that's where they were to land. So that, that was the reason for getting that island back. And it cost, cost too much, a lot, to get it back. And somewhere during my uh, battle on the island somewhere, or maybe some other marine division somewhere. I had an older brother that was in the Army Air Force, and he was shot down over Philippines, and he became a prisoner. And he told me after the, uh, the, the coup was declassified in 1968, after that, he approached me and told me what happened to him, that the Japanese took him to a radio room. 
and put a wire around his head with a tourniquet, keep twisting till he passed out. And he was uh, copying everything we said, the messages that we said. He said he couldn't put it together to make sense. He did copy everything we said. But it's just uh, the trick that we try to explain. The, the trick was so unique that it's hard to explain. It would take a, a long time to really explain it right. But uh, we, we are very proud to have tricked them and to have done what we did to, to shorten the war Saved a lot of lives, and uh, yeah, and that was yeah. Wait, wait, I'm not through yet. <laughs> to to my left is uh, Dr. Samuel Billison. To my right is uh, Keith, Mr. Keith Little. He's the treasure and he's the uh, president of the association, and I keep them there. Okay. I would have loved to do the Phil Donahue thing where I go out in the audience and say, ask a question, but unfortunately we're out of time. What I would like to do though is afterwards is have these gentlemen uh, off to the side and have some questions for them. Feel free, I'm sure they'll be happy to spend some time with you. Uh, on behalf of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, uh, thank you so much. And let's give these gentlemen a round of applause. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.